Well, this morning, um, today's message is a direct follow-on from last week's message. If you weren't here last week, don't worry, it still stands alone, but we're picking up right from where we left off last week. Um, so it is a standalone, but it will answer some of the questions that we were left with when we ended last week. Uh, and in many ways, um, this scripture that we're going to be looking at reads a summary of the same points we did last time. And I don't want to go over the same ground again, but it does bear some repeating because Paul repeats himself a little. So if Paul repeats himself a little, we'll look at what he repeats because he's repeating it for a reason. So we will look back a little bit at what we did last time. And we, answer, we, we sort of um, ended with the question, there are vessels for honor and dishonor. There's wood and there's gold in the house. How do you know whether you're wood and whether you're gold? And the answer was, you choose. You choose to be gold when you choose honor over dishonor. And how do we do that? Well, I believe the scripture we're going to look at today is the key to that question. We're going to be reading from 2 Timothy 2, verses 22 to 26. So, that so means, because of what we've just read, so, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and that may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So this section gives us some areas to focus on, areas that if we make them our pursuit, will help us keep right, will help us keep straight, hence the title of the message. Paul picks up on a few points that we've already touched on, and it's worth spending a moment just having a little look at them. <coughs> Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. I won't read all that again because I have just read it. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. Because you know they breed quarrels. This picks up on from not arguing about words because it spoils the faith of the hearer. Have nothing to do with it. This means don't fall for the irreverent babbling, but it also means don't entertain the ideas that people peddle. But it also means don't waste time arguing over it. And I know this one's tough to deal with, because I really want to argue some stuff. I do. Everything within me wants to argue with people who are wrong. <laughs> I do. But actually the best way to counter the argument isn't to quarrel, but is to speak the truth. It's to teach the truth without making it into an argument. Actually, the best way to counter something that's wrong isn't to get angry about it. It's just to speak truth and say what's true. Because the Lord's servants must not be quarrelsome. Be kind to everyone. And I tell you, I read that and I go, ooh. Because I tell you, every bit of the flesh in me wants to get into a quarrel. But we don't do it. We don't quarrel. We teach. The best antidote for a lie isn't an argument, it's the truth. We teach, we patiently endure evil, and correct gently. That's not easy in the face of heresy, because teaching that corrupts the word of God sets my teeth on edge. It does. But we must correct with gentleness and prayer that God will grant them repentance. 
That's the way you face it. When you read something in a book, you're like, whoa, that's not right. Best way is to pray that God will reveal to them what the truth is. That they'll come to their senses. That they'll come to repentance. This is actually the opposite of how most disagreements about theology actually seem to play out in the world. But this is how it should be played out. It doesn't mean you put up with it or you allow it, but you handle it without quarrel. I wish I could say that word, but I can't seem to get my mouth around the R's. <laughs> You distance yourself from falsehood. You stick to the truth, but in every part of doing so, what you are wanting is for the person who is teaching falsehood to be saved, not punished. And too often, we come at them with the punishment. It may mean you have to step back from something and say, I can't be part of this, which we've had to do as a church. But you don't do it angry. You don't do it to be contentious. See, this is a continuation of what we had last week, and I think it's very important that we restate it, because here's the reality. Try as you might, when you reason with someone who's been unreasonable, reason doesn't work. That's why it's called unreasonable. You can't reason with someone who's been unreasonable. It's fruitless. Even when a Christian leader needs to point something out or be critical of a fault or a sin or a bad teaching, and while we can't shy away from it, it must be done with gentleness and never seek to cause hurt. We must never take it personally. And we must love men and not hit them over the head until they submit to the truth. We've got to do it with gentleness. But that's not what I want to talk about this morning. This message is called keeping right, not keeping others right. So how do we ensure that we are wood? No. That we are gold, not wood. We hold fast to the truth of the gospel, but we also do these things. Flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, Love and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. And that's where I want our focus to be this morning. How are we a vessel of honor? Paul tells Timothy, flee youthful passions. Flee them. Now remember, we are hearing from an older Paul at this point. A Paul who hasn't got long left in this world. We're hearing from a Paul who once knew what it was like to battle these kinds of things. Romans 7.15, this is Paul speaking about himself. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. See, Paul knew what it was like to battle his self. He knew it. Let me tell you, if you've, ever, if you've ever felt like you've battled against yourself, if you've had that battle within you, you are not alone. Good news. Paul felt it too. You are not alone. In fact, dare I say, all of us have been in that battle. And here's Paul's advice to Timothy. He's speaking to Timothy now as someone who's learned lessons over his life on how to conquer his flesh. And his advice is this, flee, flee. This refers back to advice that Paul gave Timothy uh, in 1 Timothy 6.11 where he says, um, flee the love of money and the temptation to give into false teaching, but pursue righteousness, godliness, faith and love, and so on. But this time, he's talking about youthful passions. Flee youthful passions. Passions. It's very similar advice. Do you know why? Because good advice is always good advice. What does this term youthful passions mean? I think our heads all immediately go to one place. Lust. Well, can I say I think that is certainly something to flee, but I don't know if I would confidently say Timothy had an issue with lust. Maybe, but I think if he did, Paul would have had a great deal more to say about it. 
So lust, yes, that is a youthful passion, but youthful passion is more than just lust. As a minister of the gospel for Timothy, there were other traps. As with all of us, you know, you win one battle in life, there's another one coming, isn't there? Youthful passions, juvenile desires, cravings, and longings. See, passion can be positive, and passion can be negative. Depends what the passion's for. But youthful passion is the passions that are immature, passions that have not got the right focus, passions that lead to trouble. Remember, at this point, Timothy is probably around about 30 to 40 years old. He's no longer a youth. He's probably starting to get a bad back. (laughs) But youthful passions, if they're not fled, will follow you throughout your life. Youthful passions don't always fade with age. Youthful passions include lust, yes, but also seeking fame, pride, ambition, rashness, argumentative, stubbornness, and a whole host of other things, including impatience and impulsiveness. And for Timothy, even if lust was conquered, all of these things here are a temptation for a man in ministry. All of them had potential to destroy his ministry. In the middle of such bad teaching around the churches at the time, these useful passions would have been a natural reaction, especially stubbornness, argumentativeness, even when you're getting it right, pride. And in the middle of all of this stuff, Paul encourages Timothy not to let them take over. How? He says, flee them. Flee them. You know, we're told to stand and fight against the devil. Resist him and he will flee. Yes? When the enemy is on the attack, you stand firm against Satan. But when you're dealing with your flesh, when you're dealing with your own passions, never try and fight your flesh because you won't win. You won't. You might think you're strong enough to stand. You aren't. Never fight your flesh because you won't win. Run. Flee. Scarper. The only way to avoid the passions of the flesh is to keep out of their way. Head in the other direction as quickly as you can. When they crop up, when the flesh rises up, you run in the other direction as fast as you can. If you try and hold out against them, they will overtake you. Whoever's tried to deal with that and just their willpower alone and failed. Yeah? Of course. When you try and stand, you will fail. What you do is you go the other way. You get yourself out of harm's way. Resist the devil, yes, but flee sin. Flee the flesh. Flee those parts of your own nature that you know will drag you down if you let them. Let me tell you, fleeing is not passive. Fleeing is not something you can do by accident. Fleeing never takes place by happenstance. Fleeing is making a decision, you have got to get out of there. You have got to escape. You have got to get away. You've got to get out of that situation. And most of the times we fail to resist sin and we fail to resist the flesh because we didn't flee. Instead, we either tried to resist or we waited for something else to happen and get in the way. Have you ever physically fled something in your life? I have. I remember, sorry camera person, but this is, this is going to annoy you. I remember I got, um, I was down the Dean in um, Peter Lee and uh, I was doing a, a video project. I might have shared this before. And somebody wanted my camera. And they took it off me. And I remember going up to them, <laughs> and I cheekily went up to them and said, Okay, you can take the camera, but can I have the tape? Because I'd spent ages working on that stuff. And surprisingly, he said yes. 
So I get to the camera to get the tape out because he doesn't know how to reject it. He's just stolen it. It's not his. And I sort of wrestle the camera away. And then the only word to describe what I did was flee. <laughs> Fleeing is when you run so fast, your legs don't know what to do. <laughs> Fleeing isn't... That's not fleeing. Fleeing is. <laughs> fleeing is you. Oh dear, that was a bad idea. <clears throat> fleeing is when you want to get as much distance as possible between you and the thing you're trying to get away from. That's fleeing. So much so your legs can't keep up. You don't casually flee. When you flee, your legs feel like jelly, but they won't let your legs stop you. If your legs are staying behind, the rest of you are still going to go. <laughs> Fleeing is a verb. It means it's a word that requires action. You can't flee by not doing anything. You have to flee. So when the flesh comes, when the youthful passions come, Paul says, flee. But when you flee, don't just think about what you're running from. It's a good idea to have somewhere to go. You need to have a plan about what you're running to. If you flee without heading somewhere, you'll end up running around in circles. In fact, it's what we put in front of our eyes and run towards what we pursue that helps us flee what we should be avoiding. Matthew Henry puts it like this. The more we follow that which is good, the faster and further we shall flee from that which is evil. The more we follow that which is good, the faster and further we shall flee what is evil. If you know what you're heading towards, what your pursuit is, fleeing can become second nature. So, there are things to make your pursuit. Pursue these things and you can't go wrong. Instead of focusing just on the fleeing, which means dealing with the symptoms of a problem, make good things your pursuit. 2 Timothy 2, 22. So, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So here are the things to pursue. Now, pursue does not necessarily mean perfectly attain. So as we go through these things, if you're not getting this right, don't feel condemned feel convicted, that's fine, but don't feel condemned. Pursue doesn't mean attain. Pursue means pursue. To pursue something is not vague. Pursuing is like fleeing. In fact, it's the opposite of fleeing. You can't passively pursue anything. Pursue is also a verb. That means it's a doing word. You have to do something. Pursue is a strong word as well. This isn't just look for. The word pursue means aggressively chase after. It's not just look towards these things in the vague horizon as, as potential ideals. It's go after them like a hunter. You go after them and you hunt them down. So you might be getting these things perfect, but I tell you the impulse is as strong as the impulse for fleeing. This is going for, not from. So you mightn't get it right, perfect, but I tell you, it won't be for the lack of trying. That's pursuit. So what do we pursue? First of all, righteousness. What does this mean? This is a word used to describe justice. Right living. But the key really is a life approved of by God. That's righteousness. A life that matches up to divine approval. 
In other words, a life of righteousness is a life that does what God says is right. Right living. This is the kind of righteousness that Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after it. Now we know we can't attain this by ourselves because the Bible says there is not one who's righteous. No, not one. So it's not our righteousness that makes the difference, it's the righteousness of Jesus. We know all of our righteous deeds are like a dirty rag. But because of what Jesus did, then it is possible for us to live a righteous life. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We don't trust our righteousness because we don't have any, but we can pursue his. We can put it on. We can be clothed in it. We can be covered in the righteous life of Jesus. Therefore, he can help us live that life that's right before God. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. We pursue this way of living that is pleasing to God. And putting that on protects our hearts, protects our life. We can become the righteousness of God. The approved right way of living is available to you because Jesus took your sin. It's available. It's there. But you must pursue it. You must run after it because it won't just happen. Righteousness never happens by osmosis. You've got to run after it. That means fleeing the things that aren't pure, that aren't righteous, that aren't good. It makes making the difficult choices when presented with an option that you know God would not approve of what you're doing. It means in those moments you make the right choice instead of the wrong choice. You see, we might be saved by grace, but to say how we live doesn't matter is massively wrong. Because we're called to pursue righteousness. It means a calling to pursue what God says is right, not what we want to do. Or convincing yourself God will be okay with what you want to do. It means not giving in to the ways of the world, but following the ways of God. It does not matter how much society changes, your values don't. If we can truly honestly say that righteousness was our pursuit... We confront some habits that we've let ourselves get away with and justified for years. Yeah? We'd confront them. We'd deal with them. We'd make different decisions about our commitment to the work of God. We would take a stand for people we would otherwise ignore. We'd stop talking about people behind their backs or sowing seeds of dissension. Because to pursue righteousness is to actively seek out the approval of God. It's not the same thing as salvation by works. But it's an understanding that God's way of living is the best way of living. I wonder this morning, is righteous living a priority for you? Is righteous living your pursuit? The next thing to pursue is faith or faithfulness. What does it mean to pursue faithfulness? It can be a funny one, this one. Faith is incredibly important as a pursuit, but one that so much distorted teaching takes place about. It can leave us a bit confused. Faith has been turned into a thing. A thing that has the power to make whatever you want to happen, happen. There's movements within the church that I won't name by. Oh, yeah. The word of faith movement has turned faith into something it's not. But let's not argue with foolish controversies and instead focus with what faith is. First, faith comes from God. He is the source of it. 
and he is the object of it. And it is not about us, and it is not from us. We cannot produce it. We can't work people into such a frenzy that they somehow acquire it. No, faith comes from God. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing. And hearing through the word of Christ. Faith comes through hearing the rema, the living word of Jesus. That can come through reading the Bible. It can come through teaching. But it comes through hearing. Not man's words, but the words of Jesus. That means if you want to grow in faith... You need to hear the words of Jesus. Is that fair? You need to hear what he's saying. Faith is always a response to divine revelation. It comes from hearing from God and it's responding to the word of God. See, you can't grow in faith if you're not in the word. It's not possible because faith comes by hearing the word of God. Ephesians 2 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. You see, saving faith comes from God. The power gift of faith, where's that come from? God. He grants it. So it comes from Him, but we must pursue it. Why? Because in Romans 14, 23, it says, For whatever is not of faith is sin. In Hebrews eleven six, 6, it says, It is impossible to please God without faith. Therefore, we should have a desire in our heart to walk in faith. Because we don't want to sin, and we don't want to be displeasing to God. Faith is not the same as belief. And sometimes we confuse these two things. Faith is bigger than mere belief, although belief is certainly contained in faith. See, even the demons believe, but they don't have faith. Faith is something that as a result of belief contains confidence in God and trust in God. That's why it's impossible to please God without it, because how can you trust him? Sorry, how, if you don't trust him, how can you follow him? You can't. It's not just belief that God is there, but it's trust that he's good and that he's right and that all his ways are just. That's faith. Faith can get you through anything because faith looks at the one who's above everything. Faith gets you on your feet because the response to God's goodness and trust in his goodness should be action. What's faith without action? It's dead. Yeah. God gives us faith, but it's our duty to pursue faith. It's our duty to apply faith to every area of our lives, every area of our walk. And that's what it means to be faithful. Faith full. To be full of faith. To live in it. To walk in it. To let it inform our everyday choices. Faith keeps you anchored. Faith keeps you from sin. Faith keeps you from despair. Faith keeps you from wandering. Faith gets you praying for the sick. Faith gets you sharing with the lost. Because faith trusts that God is powerful and loving. That God is good. And that God makes a difference. It's impossible to please God without faith because it's impossible to live the Christian life without faith. When you pursue faith, you remain steady because your trust is in him alone. When you pursue faith, you do the things you can't do on your own because you trust the one who can. When you pursue faith, you pray for the sick, not because you think you're gifted, but because you trust Jesus cares for that person you're praying for. When you pursue faith, you don't see coming to church as a chore or stale. You see it as a chance to hear his word and build your faith up. 
People who pursue faith are people who desire to hear the word of God. Because faith comes through hearing the word of God. When someone truly pursues faith, you don't need to encourage them to come to church because they're hungry. Is faith and faithfulness your pursuit? Then there's love. All you need is love. <laughs> well, actually, that's not strictly true. You need righteousness. You need faith. You need peace. But love's in there. Love's in there. Now, we all know that in Greek, there's many different ways to translate love. Each meaning something different. So when we're told to pursue love, it's a good idea to check what kind of love we should be pursuing. Otherwise, you can excuse sin and say, God cares about love in all of its forms. Uh, no, that's bad theology used as an excuse for sin. Don't do that. Jesus came to teach love. So we must pursue love. The world might think that the type of love to pursue is eros. Intimate, sexual love. But whilst that kind of love is vital between a man and wife, it is not the kind of love Paul is saying pursue. The trouble with that kind of love is that when we make it our pursuit in life, it kind of overtakes us. It consumes us. It twists us. When Eros gets in your head and Eros is in the wrong focus, it just messes with you. When it's in the right place, it's wonderful. The love we are to pursue is not filial love either, that affectionate friendship type of love. This is good and it's important, especially in the life of a church, but that's not the love Paul's talking about. It's not, I'm going to say this wrong, but Paul's not here so it's okay. Felucia, self-love. It's not storge, that's the love between parents and children. That love's powerful and wonderful, but I tell you, it's hard when you go through life without that one when that's not there. But that one isn't to be our pursuit either. All of those loves are about our connection with other people. And people are not our pursuit. No, the word Paul uses, as if you didn't know, is agape. The divine, all-encompassing love of God is the love that should be our pursuit. His divine unconditional love that he has for us that's our focus see when we pursue agape we run after him we run after the love he has for us and we extend that same love back to him your love for God should never ever be conditional but how often is it we grow cold when circumstances challenge us right God that's it done with you You've gone too far this time, God. I'm not speaking to you anymore. Agape does not behave like that. Agape is unconditional. Agape doesn't require God to do things for you in order for you to adore him. Agape is focused on who he is and not what he does. Now, yes, it's a love we can also have for each other. It's the highest form of love. But the pursuit of the love of God and the love we have for God is far and away what makes the most difference in our walk. Agape is a love that prefers others. In other words, agape puts other people before you. It's agape that Jesus had for us that brought him to the cross. It's agape that enables us to think of other people as more important than ourselves. If we are putting our needs first, if we are pushing people down so that we can look taller, if our time at church is about ourselves and not the pursuit of God or getting other people closer to his love, we are not walking in agape. Agape sorts out your motivations and it sorts out your priorities. If agape is not what leads you, you can make it your pursuit. And peace. 
We are people who must always pursue peace. We serve the Prince of Peace, therefore we should be people of peace. When we are saved, we find peace with God. But as we walk, we need to pursue the peace of God. A peace that surpasses all understanding. Sometimes we define peace as the absence of conflict. And that's certainly part of what peace is, but peace is more than just a lack of conflict. It's this sense of all is made well. Completeness. Wholeness. When we make peace our pursuit in every area of our lives, we're able to look for this sense of it is well. Peace is a harmony between individuals. When we pursue peace, we don't make people out to be our enemies. We don't look for fights and arguments, which when we pursue an agape is certainly easier because most conflict comes out of a lack of love. When we seek this peace of God, we will make our pursuit that we'd always think twice before arguing with people. We'd always think twice before demeaning other people. Fighting seems to be the default setting for so many people. But peace and harmony is the default setting of someone who truly wants to follow God. Peace in life also leads to peace of mind. Our minds should be places of peace. But how often are they not? So many battles go on in the mind. The mind can be going through utter turmoil and there's no outer indication of what's going on. People don't know sometimes what's going on in the mind because it's going on in there. Church, all of us need to take responsibility for our own minds. We have to. We need to take responsibility for our own thought life. Because nobody else knows what you're thinking. As Peter tells us, gird up the loins of your mind. Take control. Nobody else other than God knows what's going on in your head. Therefore, they can't be responsible for what's going on in your head. Only you can. Pursue peace of mind because peace of mind will make an extraordinary difference to your life any person who pursues peace isn't always looking for a fight they aren't looking to stir the pot they are looking at how situations can be resolved not escalated the person who pursues peace knows how to avoid taking offence at the slightest little thing somebody says to them if you easily take offense, you need more of the peace of God. People who pursue peace are a blessing and a pleasure to be around because they bring with them this sense of it is well. It's contagious. People who do not pursue peace in their lives are always in constant turmoil, always falling out with someone or disagreeing with someone and always letting negative thoughts take over they can be a different kind of contagious to be around. Always negative, always bringing down, always stirring up problems. Don't listen to people who stir up dissension, who come and whisper in the corner. They're pursuing the opposite of peace. We are called to be people of peace. People who have wholeness, because we look for nothing outside of God to fulfill us. Righteousness, faithfulness, love, and peace. What wonderful things they are to pursue. Now, if as we've gone through that, in any of those things you think, well, I'm not in that place. I'm not getting that right. Don't feel condemned. What you've done is you've recognized the lack. That's a good thing. That's okay because, and this is very important, pursuit isn't the same as perfect. They're different. The key is getting up from this point, making a change, and making those things your pursuit. 
The key isn't what happened before today. The key is what happens after today. See, it won't just happen. You won't suddenly be filled with all of those things. You can't pursue without movement. You can't pursue without determining. But here's the wonderful thing. You don't have to do it alone. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Let me tell you, church, we are in this together. We pursue these things together. And guess what? None of us are getting them all right. We're all failing together. But we're all determining to do better together. All of these things are sought out, not alone, but in good company with other imperfect people who make these things their pursuit as well. It's not a question of where you are today. It's a question of where are you running. That's the beautiful thing about church. We are all running in the same direction. We're all hunting the same targets. And we can encourage and we can enliven each other on the journey. When your pursuits are right, you don't need anyone to convince you to be part of a church. No, you dive on in, knowing how helpful church can be. We must never seek to live detached or aloof from our brothers and sisters in Christ because we find strength and joy and fellowship with our church family. So when we set ourselves apart, that things start to go wrong. We get bitter and we start to despise the gathering. We need people around us. John Wesley put it great. John Wesley said this, a man must have friends or make friends for no one ever went to heaven alone. What's he mean? I think what he's meaning is this. Life is hard enough. It's even harder without support. Along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. A pure heart. Can I recommend you pick your friends well? Pick people who call on the Lord with a pure heart. Pick people who pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace. Because otherwise you're picking people who won't be good for you. But also, be someone who pursues God from a pure heart. Let me tell you, this world, it can make us dirty. Yeah? It's time to reclaim our innocence. It's time to reclaim our purity. It's time we wash the dirt of this world off us. Often, you see, we can focus on the things we're fleeing from. And we must flee. We must flee the flesh. We, mu <coughs> we must flee youthful passions because they will lead us to no good. But we need to be aware of what we are fleeing to. What we should be pursuing. Or you'll get caught in this endless cycle. Round and around and around you go. See, Timothy was solid. Good guy. Timothy was a good servant of God. So remember, when Paul's saying this to Timothy, he's not saying this as a slight. He's not having a go. He's saying this to help. It's not a put down to say everybody in this place, flee youthful passions. That's not a put down. That's helpful advice. It's not a put down to say pursue righteousness, pursue faith, pursue love, pursue peace. You know, when you're playing a sport... And I'm going on very vague knowledge here. Cheerleaders shout, go on. You can do it. Go for it. Probably in a song instead of just like that. When they do that, they're not criticizing the team. They aren't putting the team down. They're cheering them. They're leading them. They're supporting them. That's what Paul's doing for Timothy. He's saying, go for it. Pursue righteousness. Pursue faith. Pursue peace. Go on, son. You can do it. Flee sin. Go on, Timothy. Run faster. 
faster. Church, be cheerleaders for each other. Spur each other on. You can do it. Don't be like some who aren't like cheerleaders, but actually sound a lot more like football supporters. I don't know why they call them supporters, because sometimes it's, you rubbish, get him off. That doesn't sound very supportive to me. Don't be a football supporter, be a cheerleader. The journey is hard enough as it is. It's harder without good support. Paul's comments to Timothy here aren't there to discourage him. Let me tell you, when someone in church brings you up on something or mentions something, they're not doing that to have a go. They're doing it and go, come on. You can do it. You can do it. Paul isn't discouraging Timothy. He's spurring him on. And that's what this message this morning is intended to do for you. If you find that faithfulness, peace, love, if you find you're lacking in those areas, if you find you're not fleeing sin enough, if you're not fleeing the flesh enough, if you're standing instead of running, can I just say to you, go on. You can do it. You can do it. Go for it. Pursue these things. We've got your back. But remember, fleeing and pursuing don't just happen. Both of those things require you to move.